this week uh, we've been talking about uh, social psychology. And uh, in previous lectures, when we talk about how social psychology is the study of how the situation situations uh, influence the individual. That is, generally, in psychology, we're interested in the individual as what makes uh, this discipline unique or distinct from other social sciences. So sociology, for instance, is interested in the group, so group dynamics. Uh, anthropology is interested in culture. Uh, history is interested in all of those things, the individual, the groups, and culture, um, but obviously from a historical perspective, looking backwards, not necessarily thinking about how those things work currently or in the present. <clears throat> so here in social psychology, we're doing a, a bit of a step in the direction of the group. Uh, we're still not interested in the group. That wouldn't be psychology. We still here are interested in the individual, but just how situations affect the individual. Um, this might mean other groups of people. So this might mean how other folks affect an individual. This also might mean how the environment affects the individual. Uh, and we do some talking yesterday about how this might also just mean how your mental state uh, is affecting you. That is also a situation. If you're, if you're in a mood and you're making behaviors based on that mood, well, you would probably be able to tell yourself I'm not usually like this. <clears throat> I'm only acting this way because of the situation I'm in, which is to say because of the mood that I'm in. Does this make sense? So here we are again, just talking about how situations influence the individual. Um, I'm gonna show you one of the most uh, well-known psychology experiments. Uh, it's well-known because it's, uh, I, I wouldn't even say it's controversial. It was controversial at the time. Today, we sort of see it for what it is, uh, but also recognize that it is unethical. Of course, we wouldn't have learned that unless we'd done the experiment to see that uh, the results would be something that would be problematic. So, uh, but first, I just want to give you some terms. So this is not going to be super exciting. Um, I'll try to maybe think of some colorful examples. Uh, but I'm just going to give you some terms because I want you to be thinking about uh, these things, these concepts, when you're watching this video, for you to be able to say, okay, these are the things psychologically uh, that are going on that's going to make this, this possible, okay? So, well, one of the first ones that we talked about yesterday, uh, I won't go too much into it, is conformity. Uh, this is a pretty big one in uh, psychological research in social psychology, one that we find uh, is a pretty strong motivator for most folks. Uh, and conformity, of course, just means doing what everybody else is doing. Uh, doing what you see other folks doing. Again, we are pack animals, and so this is built deep into our code. That is to say, hey, if everybody's going in this direction, maybe I should go that way too. Maybe there's something bad that way. If everybody's um, if everybody's wearing uh, high boots and you see everybody doing that for a couple of weeks, well, you're probably going to start wearing high boots too and start looking for them. Okay, this is the Uggs phenomenon. So conforming, all right, just doing what other folks do. I show an interesting video in that class, uh, a really weird experiment. I thought about doing this, this is a, a bad year to do it, but I thought about getting a couple students um, and stopping them you know, before this class, maybe making some signal or doing something weird that I just always do. I didn't bring my coffee, but taking out my coffee and having a few of you just maybe look up to the ceiling or something and see if I can get the rest of you to do it. Uh, but we need more folks, right? Because this requires a bit of strength in numbers. Um, the best way to do it would probably be to get all of the students to do it except for one, maybe. Uh, see if I can get that one person to change their behavior. But uh, I do show a video of something like that, so you'll get to see <clears throat> how this can play out, how strong of an effect it is. It's how things like tradition, um, 
they sell things like uh, ritual or born, right? This idea of we're just kind of doing the same stuff over and over again, and I don't know why I'm doing it, but they've been doing it this way for a while, so we're just gonna keep doing it that way. Questions, informity. Another one is de-individuation. <clears throat> uh, where have you seen the term, perhaps very recently, individuation? Where have you seen that term, individuation? You've never seen the term individuation? No. You got some videos to watch. <laughs> Who's seen this term before? Individuation, I talk about <clears throat> uh, when we're talking about the human development section uh, in Carl Jung's idea of individuation. That sunset, remember this? That's the individuation process, according to Jung. And so for Jung, it's this idea of becoming yourself, right? Becoming a distinct ego, becoming an individual. <clears throat> and so, of course, de-individuation, as you might imagine, <clears throat> is the idea of losing that distinct self, losing uh, that distinct ego. There's a couple of ways, there's a couple of times when we see that this is a stronger effect. And one of the things that happens in de-individuation is that a person kind of loses track of the things that they themselves might do or not do. So you might say something like, um, I don't know, usually I wouldn't have hit that guy in the face, but I wasn't feeling myself that day, right? You've kind of come out of yourself and done something that's outside of the individual <clears throat> that you think that you are. This loss of self-awareness uh, is often accompanied by two things. One is being in a large group, especially perhaps in a large group where everybody's doing the thing. The other is when you're anonymous, when you feel relatively anonymous, when you feel like nobody's gonna know it's me, when you feel like nobody could identify me. And then the other, the last one, I think I said two, but there's three. The last one is when tensions are high, when arousal is high, when the situation is already worked up, when the situation is already heated. So when the situation's heated, there's a lot of people around and people can't tell it's you, you're very likely to do stuff, I won't say very likely, you're more likely to do stuff that you wouldn't do if I knew it was you and you thought that you could be uh, found out and you thought that these things would come back and get you. Does this make sense? Who can think of a time or an event where you've seen this play out, where you've seen de-individuation play out? Yeah. The entirety of the internet? Very good, so the entirety of the internet, so say some more. Uh, like anytime you play a video game, someone's gonna call you Santa. Okay. Because they know they can't find you. That's a great one I hadn't thought of yet, right? So they're certainly anonymous for the most part, unless you're playing with some buddies or something, yeah. right? And then depending on the moment in the game, you might have high tensions, right? You might be in this moment where, hey, we gotta kill that guy from the tower or we're all gonna lose, right? So tension's high, anonymous, and then you get some foul mouth kids to take them off outside and they would never say that in front of their parents or in front of anybody. Yes, ma'am? Okay, social media that doesn't have your name on it, right? You're probably not going to be this way if you're using your personal uh, Instagram account or you're using your personal uh, Facebook account, right? You're not going to call grandma's friend an idiot, but uh, if you've got an anonymous login or you're on some uh, website where you haven't shared your full identity, well, here might be a time where you're feeling a little freer to say something mean or say something uh, distasteful. What's another one? Real life. It's a real life one. Yes, sir. Um, like I've seen at a, a professional sporting event, people would say they'll think that they wouldn't say it to a player's face um, because they know they, no one really knows who they are because they're so in that crowd. Right. 
right, so you're in this huge crowd, and so you've got some anonymity in that crowd. You're in a game, and so maybe you're worked up because your team's winning or your team's losing, and so here you are saying stuff that you know you wouldn't say at work the next day. Uh, a lot of sports psychology, excuse me, a lot of social psychology comes from sport. Uh, this is a time when we see folks in groups, they have a particular dynamic, we get to see perhaps how, uh, and we'll see some of these terms here in a minute, what the effect of the group is on a smaller group, what the effect of the community group is on that individual. Right? And so a lot of this stuff you'll see comes from uh, sports. This one in particular, uh, we think about football for, in, in particular, uh, which is to say tension's high, you're playing a game, and you've got this big hunk of metal over your face. As humans, we have this kind of ostrich thing where <laughs> uh, we feel like if our face is hidden, we're hidden, right? I mean, it's, if you think about it, it you say, no, I know I'm not hidden, but you, you instinctually would feel that way. Uh, you feel that way when you have a pair of glasses on. Not these kind, but if you've got shades on, right? you feel a little mysterious. You might feel that way with these things on feel a little mysterious. The, the effect is stronger if you're covering your eyes, of course, but uh, this will work too. Uh, protest. Right. See a lot of folks in masks. Those are usually, not these masks, but you know, mask masks. Those are usually the folks causing problems. Right. One, they've probably thought to hide their identity, but some of those folks maybe just showed up in a mask because they didn't want to be on TV and they're like, everybody else is doing it, right? The individuation. <clears throat> Group uh, polarization. What does uh, polarization mean? What does it mean to be polarized? What am I political? Very good. And so polarizing means to take things to their uh, opposite extremes, right? If these guys were here and here, and they went here and here, they've polarized, right? They've gotten more extreme, they've gotten more separate. <clears throat> so group polarization uh, is an effect that occurs, is a polarization that occurs, and. Uh, you're hitting it right, right, when we're talking about this in terms of psychology, of course, we are talking about it in terms of attitudes, in terms of beliefs, values, thoughts, these type of things. And so in a group polarization, what we see is that folks find themselves in a group, and this is exactly what's going on politically, they find themselves in a group uh, that shares their beliefs. And maybe they're relatively moderate, right? Maybe you're a, a moderate uh, conservative. But then you start only hanging out with other conservatives. Start only watching conservative news. Start only reading conservative things. Well, we will expect that your opinions, your values, your beliefs can only go in this direction. You can only get more polarized if you're hanging out with folks who believe this certain way of thinking, this certain way of feeling. This works with religion, this works with I don't know if you're on a sports team, this works if you're, all your friends are uh, academics, and they're studying a lot, you kind of study, but they're studying all the time. Right. <clears throat> and so what we find is that folks, when they're only exposed to or only um, experiencing things that are within the realm that they are already in, what we expect to see again is that they're gonna get more extreme in that belief. This, of course, happens in the other direction as well. <clears throat> It is why our politics are polarized, uh, because folks tend to live in communities uh, that have certain political beliefs or values or religious beliefs. <clears throat> and now, uh, right, even more, we can just watch the TV channel that tells us uh, the beliefs that we already believe. And so you're never getting this exposure. You're never getting anybody to, one, challenge your beliefs, and you're never getting, perhaps, even any exposure to the beliefs at all. And so of course you're gonna go in this direction. There's also a small, or perhaps large, depending on the individual, bit of conformity going on, right? I'm this guy, everybody else is this way. Well, 
I'm not going to be able to resist the whole group for too long. I'm going to try to join this, right? And everybody else over here is going to, right? This is just going to keep happening. Well, you're that far. One, more and more. Yes, sir. Wouldn't there be demonization involved? Because you're kind of leading in front, first time you fell to conform to the group? Sure. Um, in a moment. So the individuation really refers to a moment. It really refers to an action that you've done or a way of thinking that you're having, right? So in that moment, you are individualized, individuated. <clears throat> this is sort of a, a, a more global change to the individual, right? They are really kind of buying into these new beliefs, these new way of thinking that could lead into a de-individuated moment, of course, right? If they're going out with these folks, and we've seen that. But uh, the de-individuation itself is something specific. It's something uh, we would point to and say, hey, you weren't yourself in that moment. Here, you're becoming a new self. The answer to this, of course, by the way, go talk to some folks who don't think like you. Hang out with some folks who don't hang out, who don't think like you. It's basically a brochure for diversity. Right? More to the point, we have something called, probably this one first, in group bias. <clears throat> Um, In-group bias is super simple. Uh, it's our preference, it's our bias for our own group, the group that we are in. It's our bias for the group that, uh, that we are in. This is a super strong effect. We humans are really easy to trick, really easy to manipulate. If uh, I had you, I gotta get some of these experiments to happen in here, I do it too. But if I had you come in one day and I said, uh, I want all of you to wear blue, and I want all of you to wear red. And I let you keep doing that for, I don't know, a few weeks. Eventually, you would, for no other reason, eventually you would start to feel some kinship towards the folks that had the same color on you. And then, you would probably begin to feel a little bit of disdain, or at least competitiveness, with the group that had the other color on with you. We tend to prefer our own groups, and it just happens, right? We tend to prefer folks who we identify with, who we see something that we have in common with, and we're gonna say nice things and feel connected to those people, and the folks that feel on the other side of that we're almost automatically uh, gonna have some negativity or at least uh, a preference for our own group. There's an experiment called the This might be the wrong name. <laughs> you look this up and it's something else. <laughs> uh, I think that's the name. Uh, it's called the Robbers Cave Experiment, I think. Um, but it's about this, uh, this summer camp. They get the summer camp and they have, it's a group of boys there. Um, and basically they hide the fact, there's two groups of boys there, and they hide the fact from each group that there's another group there for a while. And so the kids think that they're the only folks at the summer camp, and right, they just kind of schedule things so that they never see each other, they're never eating or playing or even out of their cabins at the same time. And eventually, uh, they find out. They start seeing signs, and uh, they, they, the, the camp counselors help them discover that there's somebody else here at this camp. How do they feel about these other folks? What do you think? Curious. Question. Curious? Well, they don't like them. They just don't like them, right? Who are these other guys? Why are they using our fire pit? You see they left that rock out of place? They don't even respect this place, right? This has happened. This sort of automatic in-group bias. You've never met these folks. You, you do kind of share a thing in common. You're at the same summer camp. You're a group of kids, right? Maybe you should like these folks, but no. We immediately kind of form into a group and have some competitive thoughts. Uh, if not negative thoughts about this other group. <clears throat> group polarization. What happens in this experiment, right, because they're interested, how do you break this? This is the real nature of this experiment. We know this happens. How do you stop that from happening? 
So they make up this third group uh, that's at the camp too. Um, for whatever reason, this group is sort of allowed to be the bad group. And these campers are messing up the camp, they're leaving trash everywhere, they're you know, putting things out of place. And so they get the first two group to work together to clean up the camp. After this, now they feel like a group and they hate this third group. <laughs> and so it continues, uh, but you do find this way of getting this group together. And it may have still worked if they hadn't made another enemy. They just said, hey, the camp looks really uh, bad. We need to get together and clean it up. And that might have been enough to join them together. Uh, but again, the answer here is to connect with the other group, right? Get some exposure, work together, do some things. And you'll see they're not such bad guys. Question. To this point, we have another term called the near exposure effect. This one's pretty cool. The near exposure effect is sort of a counter to these, which is to say the near exposure to something is more likely to make you like it. That is to say, the next time you see it, you're gonna like it more. Anyone ever had this experience where you see or experience or have some experience with something, you kinda don't like it, and then you experience it again and you're like, not so bad. And maybe again and you're like, ooh, I love it. What you got? Yeah. yeah. You don't want to uh, My family and property uh, out in Montreal, and then at the beginning I hated weeding. Yeah. I just hated it, I couldn't get, I couldn't get it down. Okay, and so you just had this thing, this job that you're doing, and you know, first you didn't like it. Some exposure to it, some experience with it, not so bad. Yeah. Good. What else? It's an example you all know. Yeah. I'm too on pod and like my first product. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't like it, right? Anything that you say is an acquired taste, right? That's basically what we're talking about. Beer, probably. I don't know how old you are. It didn't matter. You're in college. But acquired taste, right? I gotta remember there's a camera up. Sometimes <laughs> I'm talking in here. So uh, the one that, that that you all will recognize is is music, right? Somebody puts out a new album. Somebody you like put out a new single. You're like, what is this crap? It used to be so good. You hear it a couple more times, you hear it a couple more times, and then it's your favorite song, right? Oh, they're still great. I just had to catch up. Right? This is the mirror exposure. Yeah. Isn't it usually you like it at first and then you start to hate it? Because I feel like that's the most common thing, isn't it? Like you first at first you listen to a song, you're like, oh this is good, and then you start to listen to it, you start to hear certain things with it, you start picking up on certain lyrics and hate the song because you realize Oh, it's not what you thought. I don't think so. Does that happen to you? Yeah, it's, I don't. I've never had it be the other way around. Interesting. I think um, uh, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret here. This doesn't happen to me much either. I'll be honest. I'm I'm that way too, or something. Um, it's more interesting at first than it is the second time. I think I think it's an ADHD thing. <laughs> not. I don't know about you, but uh, for me, I think it's an ADHD. ADHD folks tend to be really curious, and so that thing the first time is like, whoa, that's cool, it's neat. And then the second time, you're like, I already looked through it. I haven't seen that book. <laughs> but for, <laughs> but for, you know, neurotypical folks, I'm not diagnosing you, but for neurotypical folks, um, it tends to be the other way around. And, and I would say for me, you know, at least that music thing that's happened. Um, one way that we see it in a lot of this research uh, on the near exposure effect actually revolves around attraction actually revolves around whether somebody finds another person attractive. So if you've got somebody that you think is cute and they don't think you're cute, just keep showing up. Near exposure, hopefully they'll like you better the next time, unless maybe they're weird like us and 
It says on your notes. I didn't notice that the first time. <laughs> yeah, Amanda. What you said? I said I feel so good about myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to talk about movies. So. It'll be all right. Uh, so we are exposed to reflect. I think this is my last term. Um, bystander. one that I think has gotten some sort of popular attention um, due to uh, some, some, some things really in kind of the Me Too, Title IX uh, kind of movement. Uh, you hear bystander education get talked about uh, relatively often, and it comes from this term, uh, the bystander effect. Have you ever heard of this before? This is one some folks have sometimes heard of. Uh, what is the bystander effect? Uh, it's like if if no one like does anything about it, it's more likely that no one will do anything about it. Because like if you ask someone on the street, other people are gonna pass them on the street who aren't doing anything. Right. So it's a strange thing that happens where you might see somebody. In particular, we usually think about this as maybe somebody who needs help, right? Um, and the bystander effect suggests that when you see somebody who needs help, who needs assistance, who you could be useful to. You're, you're pretty likely, you're more likely, I guess, at least, to help that person if it seems like you're their only option. If you're driving down a highway in the middle of, I don't know, New Mexico, and it's deserted, and you see this, somebody who you think you'd trust, just another college student, and they've got their hood up and they're smoking and they got two flat tires, you're more likely to stop there. You still might not, or at least call somebody. You're more likely to stop or call somebody or offer some assistance in that case than you are if you're driving down a packed highway. If you're driving down a highway and car after car is passing that same car, right? This is because we think that in your head somewhere, you're thinking somebody else will help. There's all these folks around. Somebody's gonna help. Well, everybody's thinking that. Everybody's thinking somebody else is gonna help. And so in this case, we get this bystander effect where it turns out nobody helps, right? In some cases, when it's, you know, the car scenario, you kind of have this moment of a decision, right? Boom, do I help or not? But if you think about it um, in terms of you're walking down a street or you're at a party or you're at, you know, just some place where you're going to be for a while, um, also this can click in with this idea of conformity Nobody else is helping. Maybe I'm missing something. Right? Maybe that's not really a fight. Right? Maybe that person's not really uh, getting beat up. Nobody else seems to be doing anything, so I guess it's fine. Right? And again, because you're thinking that way, everybody else is thinking that way, and you don't do anything. In addition to that piece of, well, maybe somebody else has already called for help, or maybe somebody else has already tried to stop it. Bystander effect. Make sense? By the nod, nobody got it. Isn't this really common in like China? It's a huge problem in China, actually. Say more. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's like, there, I, I don't remember what this was, but there were like people being hurt and they would die in the streets because no one would help them. Mm -hmm. And people that just didn't care. And I think it was pretty common in India too, where they've got such a large population. Don't, don't give a shit about each other. Interesting. I, uh, a couple things. One, a piece of that is probably cultural. Um, what I'm thinking of is just this idea of a more communal society. Here's, you know, I usually preach against individualism. But, uh, you know, here's a moment where in America we have a bit of a hero complex, you know, and so there's a bit pushing against that. Like, I could save them, right? I could get in there and beat up the bad guy. You're not thinking that explicitly, but we feel a little more called to do that, right? We feel a little more called to be the hero. The other thing, and this is just anecdotal, I used to live in uh, New England in New Hampshire, um, and it's a small state, and like the, it's 
sort of like the brain. You know, this is uh, Missouri's cities. In New Hampshire, it's like there's, you drive five minutes, you know the town. Five minutes, you know the town, right? Here, it's like Lone Jack, nothing in Warrensburg, right? So because of this, you know, there's a lot of people packed into each one of these little towns, too. And I've observed in, in New England that folks are really, like, comfortable having you in their space without acknowledging you. In the Midwest, if you get close to somebody, they're going to give you that half smile that you do around here. So they're just going to say, you know, hello or something. Uh, here, you could be standing right next to somebody, and they will ignore you. And I've seen that same, I'm bringing this up, right, because you kind of see that. I've never been to China or Japan, but you see that in China and Japan, those kind of packed trains where you see stuff going on, right, and kind of none of this reaction. So I also think what I'm saying is I think that you're right, right? The more folks are kind of packed in a place, the more you learn to kind of block out what's going on right next to you, right? You kind of need that because you don't have as much personal space as you have in socially distant Missouri at this moment. And so I think that probably uh, also strengthens that effect. Long story long. Other questions? Bystander effect? Or any of these uh, terms? Uh, so I've got a couple others. I think I'm going to do those next time uh, just because something I want to do to the class uh, to make it stand out. We've already started. Uh, I will give you one more, sorry. Uh, foot in the door phenomenon. Foot in the door phenomenon. <clears throat> uh, what's it mean to get your foot in the door? What's that mean? Look at that. Way back. Yes, ma'am. That's you. Get your foot in the door, I want to get my foot in the door. You heard that? No? Foot in the door? What's that mean? Um, so it's kind of like uh, if you know someone, you got to know someone. So say you're trying to get a job and like your friend knows the owner and you then meet him through the friend. You kind of have to put in the door when the guy's more, more likely to use you for his job or to get hired for something. Very good. So he's given this example of you're trying to get a job, your buddy knows somebody who works there, you meet that guy, you make a good impression. It doesn't get you the job, but it probably makes it more likely that you'll get it if he can put a good word in or if he has some hiring power, right? And so in that way, you've gotten your foot in the door, right? It's this idea literally of the door's open, I got my foot in, now I can get back in myself. Right? You're not all the way in, but your foot's in. So you get your foot in the door, um, and this phenomenon in particular is just describing our tendency to do something, to do a large thing for someone, to do a large favor, usually, for someone, after we've agreed, after we've already agreed to doing a small favor for them. There's this experiment where they test this out. It's a good time to talk about it. Um, it's not contentious, but it is. Uh, a political renaissance. So, um, during some political campaign years and years ago, they went around to folks' houses and they said, hey, we know you support this candidate. Uh, we want to put uh, this huge sign in your yard. You know, it's a 20-foot sign. <laughs> Bigger than what I'm doing, but it's a huge 20-foot sign. We want to put it in your yard uh, just to show your support for the candidate, maybe encourage other folks to, to vote for this person, too. Uh, how do you feel when you get this sign in your yard? <clears throat> Some folks say yes, we don't care about those folks, all right? Enjoy your sign. Some folks um, say no, and here's where our experiment begins. For the folks that say no, we say, okay, well, yeah, I understand. This is a really big sign. It's got a beautiful lawn. You don't, maybe don't want to mess it up. Uh, we have these smaller signs, though. How do you feel about uh, maybe just a small sign? Okay. So, um, greater number of folks, or any percentage really of improvement of the folks who said no, said yes to this smaller sign. That's the first piece of the foot in the door phenomenon. First, ask for something big, then ask for something small. 
which are more likely to give you that same answer. True. We come back a week later. We only go back to the folks who accepted the small sign. And we say to those folks, hey, thank you so much uh, for letting us put this sign in your yard. Um, we just want to ask one more time, it'd be super helpful to us if you could put that big sign in your yard. And again, here we find that once somebody's done a small favor for you, we're more likely to do a large one. And so some significant portion of the folks who initially said no to the large sign, but said yes to the small sign, will eventually come around and say yes to the large sign. That is to say, we got the small one in with the intention of just coming back and asking for the larger one later. This is the foot in the door, right? This is getting that one guy to know you so that maybe you can get this bigger thing later. Questions about this? Foot in the door. All right, that's the last one. So we're gonna watch the thing. We have some time, we'll talk about it. Be prepared to talk about it. Um, and again, in particular, I'm looking for you to think about where you see any of these things. Uh, just in addition to learning about this uh, pretty interesting time in psychological research. Uh, it's a, it is a bit long, so. He's, he says real quick. He talks about this guy named Milgram, uh, and and this is a study in conformity. It's a study in I think it's probably a foot in the door in conformity for the most part. Uh, real quick, this study was interested in how did Nazis get bad? You know, like how do you make a whole country just bad people? How do you make all these soldiers uh, just do these really horrific crimes? And so they set up this experiment, basically, to get guys to sit um, in this room, and their job is to ask questions to somebody else who they think is another research participant. And they're supposed to ask these questions to this guy, and anytime he gets the question wrong, uh, they send him an electric shock. And there's not just a buzzer for the shock, there's not just this button uh, for, the, for the shock, there's also this dial that goes from, you know, I don't know what voltages are, so I don't know, 10 is that a lot? And then over here, they actually, if you see the picture, it's, I think we would think it's ridiculous today, but um, there's like a picture that just is like, it literally looks like this, it's like dead. Right? So they go up in numbers, and then when you get over here, there's this image that indicates death. And so the idea is every time the person gets a question wrong, you shock them and you turn the dial. Mm -hmm. Right? And you just keep doing this. The other person on the other side is, of course, Confederate. If you haven't heard me say it before, Confederate just means they're in on the experiment with us. Uh, they're not actually being shocked. They're pretending to be shocked. Uh, and so they're sitting on the other side of this room, and when the guy presses the button, they kind of just make a sound as if they've been electrocuted or something. So we just want to see how far folks will go with this. Uh, and not only are they just sitting in the room and given this instruction, there's a researcher standing over them, the, the professor doing the research, standing over them. And any time the guy says, I don't know, this is getting a little strong, or it sounds like he's getting hurt over there, or I don't hear him responding anymore, that does happen, the researcher would just say, uh, we must go on, the, the research must continue. Right? And so he just continues to sort of urge them on um, to do this thing. And not everybody killed the other guy, but a lot of folks did. And what this research helped us to understand is the power of authority, in particular. Conformity, but also authority. Because what these guys would say, when we would debrief them and say, well, why did you do that? You know, why would you sit there and let some professor have you kill a guy that you've never met? And they say something to the effect of, just following orders. It was just following orders. And there's all these sort of, uh, videos of Nazis being interviewed 
after World War II, and when you ask them, why did you do? They will say, just follow the orders. And so this research is interested in how we make people do things that again, they wouldn't really do, or they wouldn't naturally want to do, or they'd say even, I would never do that. But what does it take to push people in this direction? And here's a whole list of things right, that will get folks to do things that they don't think that they would do. Um, and authority is a big one. Yes, sir. I was just going to add, the math if I remember correctly, it was, it was the soldiers, wasn't it? Wasn't What's it? that? Was it, it was the soldiers, wasn't it? It wasn't the people? Because I think... If, Where did the soldiers come from? <laughs> well, no, 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 I know, but like in the soldiers' case, most of them were polarized through uh, military training. It wasn't, it wasn't more so the actual Nazi ideology as it was the training in the military. I mean, we see it in our own military now where... You know, they have a drill sergeant train them and yell at them and yep. do it, and then they follow orders without yep. question. Yep. But, I mean, like, the people themselves was different than the Nazis. So I don't mean the people. I didn't mean the soldiers, right? But but I, I just mean to say, like, our military here, these are just 18-year-olds who say, I think we want to join the army. And next thing you know, they're in a war, and you've got to kill this guy you grew up next to because mm -hmm. he's Jewish. Right? How do I convince myself to go through with that? I'm just a regular person, really. You know, I've had some training, but I still want to kill this guy I used to play soccer with or whatever. So uh, it turns out, right, that you're right. It is that authority. Some of it's the training, but here we have this experiment to demonstrate these were just college students. Mm -hmm. So you might say it's just the training in the case of the military, right? If I pulled Joe Schmo out of glass and I said, hey, over there's a guy. If he gets the question wrong, shoot him. No, you have to. Right? Is he going to do it? And at the end of that, is he going to say, well, you told me to shoot you? Make sense? Yeah. So that's what he's, I, I just wanted to get that, because that's the, that's, he's actually saying right here, that was the worst psychology experiment uh, before his. And so he's saying, this guy called him, the guy who did that research, and he's saying right now, he was like, thank you for taking the heat off of me, because I was a bad guy for a while. Social psychology experiments and controversy. Shortly after that story of the experiment, Disney president Bill Gurr embraced the request, so happy that he did get this one. He says that now he can take on some of the tedium that he's had in daily work of having done the most unethical group studies. Although this experiment was over 30 years old, its enduring power has been underscored by the events that have occurred. Well, we got the
you do is have the power and the environment to change and transform otherwise normal people. Much as the snow globe has changed or transformed otherwise normal people in an obedient situation, we wanted to do it in a prison like situation. Over 70 men volunteered to win Barbara's experiment. And they completed the battery of psychological tests. And it takes two guys to plug a fork with the most normal, most healthy, academic drawings, academic traits. And it's like flipping a coin from heads with just the largest in the system. But at the beginning, there's no difference in the kinds of people who are in the two groups. When we were given our jobs as a uh, guard, we issued uniforms with the four groups to pack the uh, lighter colored uniforms. And then we gave them the symbols of power, a handcuff, a whistle, a big dirty cloak. And then those things that had more silver reflecting sunglasses mirror sunglasses on that they didn't see the eye hole. I think that any time you put on what essentially is a mask, and you mask your identity, then it allows you to behave in ways that you would not behave if you didn't have the mask on. To make it more realistic, I have arranged with this Palo Alto Police Department to make mock arrests. When I was arrested, it was a surprise to me. I didn't think I was going to be brought to that that I was going to go through a booking process. The guards then put a blindfold on me, stripped them naked, and then they put me in dresses, smocks, and small underpants. Each had a number that had been placed in it, and had a Moby number that they could only use for a cadaver number. And they had a chain on one foot, which was put there to remind them at all times of their walk of freedom. So for all of these things, the use of the sense of being dehumanized.
so what'd you, what'd you see there? What'd you learn? I don't have a lot of time, so yes, ma'am. What'd you get? Yep. Um, I don't know, like the group polarization effect. Like you have your prison guards that are like extreme on one end, like taking their authority too far, and then you have your prisoners who are like having breakdowns because of it. And I don't know. I feel like that's just. No, that's great, right? So you saw, and, and when I was talking about this, I, I noted how easy it is to do, right? To put you in two different sets of clothes, and, and you'll start to feel the way about the other side. Now, they did extra stuff, right? The, they played on a lot of these things, the mirror glasses, the new leg, all this, <clears throat> to further differentiate uh, them. But that level of differentiation got such an extreme effect. Again, imagine what something small can do. Right? It can probably still have uh, a rather significant effect if it's just these folks tend to wear that color, these folks are in that fraternity. Yes, sir? Uh, it's a bystander effect. As things got worse, because no one else would do something, people would stop trying to, you know, the prisoners went from rebelling to just accepting it and moving on and kind of doing what they wanted. No one was standing up anymore. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, I would say you see that on both sides. You see that with the yeah. prisoners, and you see that with the guards. Um, with the researchers as well, because the guy himself in there, he had lost himself to it, but he watched it. Interesting. I have to think about that, right? And I mean, you might be right. You might be like, if it was really bad, my, my research assistant would tell me, or, or but he, they he would already call it. it until someone else who had no actual viewpoint came in and said, what the hell is this? Right. So, uh, so I think you're right. There may be some bystander effect there, too. Um, the, the other thing I'm, I'm thinking about with the bystander effect is, you know, the guards, they didn't all seem to be, like, really wanting to do all that, right? They didn't all seem to be, uh, kind of wanting to play that, that game that the guy that they're interviewing, uh, really wanted to play, right? That, that maybe just came out of him, and maybe that wasn't something the situation set up. There have been some folks who said that that guy in particular actually had some, uh, psychopathic quality, sociopathic qualities. I feel like, and some people want to discount the experiment for this, I think that is more true to life, right? That sometimes you will have one bad apple, right? Sometimes it isn't just the situation. Sometimes there is an individual who's in the situation <clears throat> who is uh, instigating bad behavior. And still we see, right, that the other folks kind of just stood by. They, they really didn't interject themselves. And like you say, for the prisoners, at first there were these revolts, they tried to push back, but eventually they're not really pushing back to help their own, uh, their own fellow prisoners. Wasn't it, at the end of it, wasn't it, they could have blankets, but they send one of their own into the... Yeah, yeah. and so they're kind of making them divide amongst themselves uh, as well, so that they can't kind of polarize and fight back. But, yeah, that was just the guy, right? That's just the rule he made up. Uh, that's not something that was supposed to or not supposed to happen. What else? What other things do you see here? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the mere exposure effect with the guards, especially the one guard, like, slowly but surely they enjoyed having the authority over the prisoners. Right, so at first it's, the, he says the guards found it kind of awkward. And I don't know, go sit in your cell, right? And then you see by day two, by day three, they're bossing them around, making them do ridiculous and embarrassing things. Uh, they sort of pretty quickly get used to that power. They pretty quickly um, learn to like what it is that they're doing. What else? A couple more. Yes, ma'am, what did you say? Yeah, I really like his his self awareness there, right? His ability to note that he had a role in the situation as well. That is to say, he was also in that situation right, as the prison warden, even if somewhat removed, and he wasn't able to see his way out of that. Right? It took somebody else coming in who hadn't been involved from the start to say, "This is changing who you are. This is not the person that I'm used to." Uh, interacting with it was her it was his uh, girlfriend even so <clears throat> you know that ability 
uh, to see that change in him and his ability to later, I mean much later, right? He's probably 20, 30 in those pictures and probably 50, 60 there. Um, but much later, at least, able to say, yeah, that was affecting me too. I was also um, in, in that space. So that's something that's pretty difficult to do is again, notice when we are being affected by a situation. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Um, Right, so you see that polarization happen, and you see that your exposure to that polarization happen, and then you see that they quickly are biased for uh, their own groups, right? You, you see that uh, certainly the guards like themselves more than they like the prisoners, and though not stated explicitly here, you can imagine that the prisoners probably like each other more than they like the guards, right? And so you get this uh, this type of in-group type of in-group bias, right? And even when they show up, right, even before the roles have really stuck, you can see that this bias has, has already formed, right? The even willingness to be the guard to the prisoner and to begin to uh, treat them in that way means that I've already kind of assumed I'm this person and you're that person and here's what we gotta do, even if I feel, feel silly about it. Yeah? The input or foot in the door phenomenon, as soon as the one guard started, that's all it took for the you know, foot piece to break. That's right, he was serving again. Uh, some people would say that guy is problematic to the, to the outcome, but I think he's probably essential to the outcome, which is to say, he's starting all this stuff. Hey, looks like the first day, take all your clothes off and you know we're gonna make you do jumping jacks or something in the middle of this uh, hallway. And so, right, other prisoners or other guards may have found that to be strange or may have said, hey, I'm not gonna be the one to do that. but. Again, you see later that more than just that one guy uh, is, is sort of doing these type of things. But <clears throat> okay, um, next week we will probably have one more day of just a couple things here. Then we will start talking about uh, multicultural psychology, um, and it'll be around that time, maybe even just Tuesday, when I start telling you guys about the paper, uh, your research paper that's due. So. Uh, if you have questions about that, watch that video and show up with them on Thursday. Happy, day. Okay, happy weekend.